Welcome to Mind Crime Liberty Show with me, Swithin Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we discuss, why don't central banks print even more money? Tim. I've been thinking about the Federal Reserve for some time, and and about six years ago, Rob, uh, Robert Murphy, Bob Murphy, had a debate with MMT, or an MMT, or the most famous MMT, or arguably, um, over central banks. And MMT is an interesting theory because it's sort of just like Keynesianism all the way. And a lot of Austrians will will criticize the Federal Reserve for printing money, devaluing the currency, and so forth. Um, and then, but the but the MMT or just says, why not do it more? So instead of saying there's a lot being done, why not do it more? There's a lot of interesting memes and stuff. You know, um, you know, they have like the Austrian looking guy on the left side saying, "Haha, you can't artificially inflate the economy by creating money to fight an economic downturn." You can't change market signal by signals by using monetary policy. You're distorting natural interest rates. And then the guy at the Fed goes, "Haha, money printer go burr." And there's other there's other good ones like money printer go burr. Like uh, you can't bail out banks with trillions of dollars. Money printer go burr, and so forth. So printing money, especially to politically connected people, is extremely useful. Um, and inflation is the way they would arguably pay for it. Um, if you want to say that there's a sort of natural economy out there. And Swithin recently pointed out an interesting election by the aforementioned Bob Murphy on inflation. Um, and there are sneaky ways in which, and Murphy points out, there are sneaky ways in which inflation gets hidden, like making the sizes of the containers smaller, reducing the quality, and so forth. And as Peter Schiff points out, the people measuring this, um, the government mainly and government agencies, um, are to say, are so to speak, captured and have a very strong interest in saying that inflation is very low or whatever their specific prescribed rate they want it to be. Um, so, like, you can just you can always remove fuel, or we'll just say housing and cars have gotten better. So the reason houses and cars cost more and so forth is is this. So maybe inflation isn't even measurable, but since the government is doing the measuring, the government has an incentive doing it. Like to repeat, printing money is quite politically useful. Unlike traditional taxes, there's no tax bill that gets paid. It's sort of sneaky. It's almost like a natural event that happens in the background. And this is to sort of the Austrian analysis. Like one of the key points of Austrians, economists, as opposed to like Milton Friedman's, well, somewhat, but is um, is that? And you know, there's also global effects to this. We had an episode on the global Kantian effects and third worldism, and I've been suspicious of printing money. And the power of it. Um, so, like, you know, the fact that I can buy stuff in like Egypt or El Salvador with with U.S. dollars, and like the, the Federal Reserve could just print them out, send them to an American bank indirectly. Again, we had an episode of Moldbug and Mises about central banking. I mean, in effect, that's what you know. We can just basically print money. And Putin, of all people, was complaining that, um, you know, in one of his recent addresses, that American just print doesn't make anything. It just subsidizes itself by uh, printing out money. Um, so, so internally, inflation also re- distributes resources. You can buy infrastructure projects. Um, uh, well, money printing, which causes inflation, arguably, uh, gives certain people, the people who get the money the first, real ability to buy things. So you can build bridges, you can build dams, you can build military hardware, you can build roads. So again, it's extremely useful. You can bail out Boeing, you can bail out you know, Raytheon, you can, you can give all sorts of, all your friends money, you can give teachers unions universities. So printing money is useful. Inflation is politically problematic, but the real, but that seems to get hidden somewhat. And there isn't a measurable problem to it. Like I do agree that inflation might be hard to measure because like, how can you compare a car from now to 50 years ago here? Um, so I'm going to start with that question here because the, if inflation is a tax, um, which I think it is, and I think it's quite clear it's a tax mainly paid by by the government. You can sort of see that gold and Bitcoin, like one of the things the gold bugs would say is that like money might have been more stable when it was tied to gold, arguably, and it goes off it and so forth. So I'll start that with, and what do you make of my overall comments on inflation, uh, money printing, and its usefulness, especially to the state, not to everyone else, but to the state and its the state friends? It seems to be useful. And can inflation, which would be the, the negative, or the negative externality, which isn't always a negative externality, like making certain aspects of the working class um, and making certain aspects of people abroad poor is actually a feature. This is not a bug to certain elites. This is a feature. The fact that 
you know, certain people, certain the plebes are poor and less politically mobile. That's actually a feature if you want to keep the population pacified. It's not a bug. So even even the things that are viewed as bugs, like inflation might be a good thing to certain people, arguably. So can it be measured? And is am I correct about how useful it is for the state? Swithin? So when it comes to measuring inflation, uh, and by which I mean here price inflation, it is actually quite difficult even on an individual basis. In general, the way you might think about price inflation is how much more money do I need to spend this year compared to last year to buy the same quantity of goods and services that I bought last year? And so if I do buy the same ones, then you can see how much more I need to spend and what the percentage increases in the inflation rate, which is straightforward, relatively speaking. But the problem is if any individual price of anything goes up, well, then you might switch over to something else. Now, the fact you switched over to something else, at least assuming your taste and preferences remain the same, is probably worse quality. But then you're getting into some what of a subjective realm that's beyond just pure numerical measurement. So that's going to be... Um, even on an individual basis, um, precisely calculating inflation is going to be difficult because you're going to have to have this sort of subjective quality um, deflator in there. If prices, things go up and you switch away from, say, Coke to Pepsi because Pepsi is cheaper, um, whereas you preferred Coke, but because Pepsi is now cheap enough relative to it that you'll buy that instead. Um, this is then clearly compounded. Uh, when you look at the inflation rate in general, which is a, the, the consumer price index, which is just a, a basket of 600 goods and services, which is the average household and um, what they spend on. Um, and then they um, try and take into account as well. And this is how they un, they keep the inflation figure down is they'll do well, you know, the car might be 10 percent more expensive, but the, the car is 10 uh, percent better than it was. So actually the price stayed the same, even though the sticker price has gone up. Something called the Donics, which again you could understand why you do it, because you might think, well, if something is better, um, but it costs the same, then it's kind of cheaper. It's better value than it was before. So you get to a very difficult situation as to how to actually measure what price inflation actually is. Uh, it clearly exists. It is clearly the case that you know prices are going up. Uh, and you have to spend more pounds to buy the same goods as you did before. Um, but actually precisely measuring it uh, is not straightforward. Additionally, as well, if you know, things get smaller as well, it's not really done by weight. So uh, there are a um, huge number of um, sort of issues on calculating price inflation, even if you did it on an individual basis, and then you have to do it on an average basis instead. Um also, you could claim, you know, it excludes producer prices as well, which you might want to include, although we don't really need to go there. Um, when Austrians, though, talk about inflation, what they're primarily talking about, uh, they'll use the term monetary inflation, which is something very easy to measure in a sense. That is, well, is the money supply gone up? If it has, we've had inflation. Why? Because, well, what inflation is, is printing more money. Uh, and in principle, you could have inflation, even if you had a pure gold standard, 100% reserves, if you just have more gold, you would have more money. And that would be inflationary in a sense. Although um, I don't remember how Rothbard mentions this, but I'm sure some Austrians have said, oh, inflation is only really inflation if you sort of print like more notes than there is gold uh, in sort of com such that you're basically running fractional reserves or something on those lines, or if fiat money is increasing. So in the sense of um, of measuring um, inflation, clearly measuring the money supply is more easy than measuring and has is more cogent. Other than you get the question of what constitutes the money supply. Um, listeners may be aware of measurements like uh, M1, M2 and M3 in monetary aggregates. Um, but um, Joe Salerno and Rothbard in the late 80s um, came up with the Austrian money supply uh, as a sort of an alternative way, given the Austrian understanding of money. Um, so even there, it's not necessarily straightforward what constitutes um, money. So that would be um, the points on measurement. But even though it's not really that measurable and that precise, it is it, it, it does clearly exist. Uh, and Tim, as you pointed out, um, it, it is politically um, advantageous because essentially it's a hidden tax. Um, and this is where I would focus more so on money printing than uh, the inflation rate, 
because what really matters is how close you are to the printing press. The closer you are to the printing press, you can buy more goods and services than you could before. If you're sufficiently far away, you'll actually be made worse off because by the time the money reaches you, prices will have gone up by more than your purchasing power. Has, well, your nominal income has gone up. That is your sort of take home, like what the notes and coins say, and therefore you'll be made worse off. Um, and uh, with respect to the basically the Kantian effects, and that's the most important aspect, and that's how it affects the acts as a as a hidden tax. Um, so those would be my sort of general overall thoughts to begin with. So my next question here for you is, why isn't there more printed? So you could say, well, they have a they have a, some sort of natural interest rate, or there's sort of a natural limit of what um, I cannot what they can actually do. But I mean, this sort of gets into the critiques that some pe- some actual libertarians will make of the Austrian libertarians um, is that you know Peter Schiff has been calling for the collapse of the U.S. central bank for years and. Um, it you know it just sort of keeps rolling along, and David Friedman would argue this is in a sense a non-prediction. Um, there's others, of course, that sort of make a similar version of that. But Peter Schiff is, you know, like he predicted nine out of the last two uh, recessions, which is the sort of joke he makes, which sort of joke made. But um, in that sense, it's a non-prediction here. Um, so we sort of explain how they're actually able to, and this is where deficit spending also kicks in. I'd argue too um, that you know this is the only way they can actually afford. The deficitary spending, arguably, at least in theory, at least my understanding of it, which is much more limited than yours, arguably. But um, why isn't there more central bank printing? Like, what would be the limit? What would be the um, de facto limit of how much they could print? Because, like, once you see how politically useful it is, you know, is in the United States, the Federal Reserve supposedly is politically independent. Now, whether whatever that means, I don't know. I'm not. I my knowledge on this stuff subject is is somewhere in between here and i've been some also following tom luingo of gold goats and guns blog too and he says that the federal reserve has been trying to fight inflation and, and he actually believes it because you know the new york commercial banks don't want to have to be taken over by central bank digital currencies and so they're trying to save themselves um so now again i'm not i'm not uh, super up on this topic in, in terms of knowledge here but it seems like there's this huge, strong impetus to print more money. You just give it to all your friends. It's 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 sort of like the um, it's sort of like you know it's alchemy. Uh, you're turning a, a de facto worthless product, paper, and actually today it's not even paper. You don't even need to turn lead into gold. What all you or you don't even need to turn plastic into gold. All you need to do is just you know send out you know digital currency, so to speak, and much money is digitalized. So why don't they do more? What's stopping you know the, the central bank in London is it each other is it, is it sort of like a is it sort of like a, a beauty contest where like all the banks can't look too much uglier than you know the central bank of Japan could print a lot of money but it can't print so much money that it makes it look bad compared to the European central bank or the American central bank like what what's stopping them from printing more considering how politically useful it is it just solves all the problems and this is again where the Austrians I'd kick in there is like Printing money, and we see this with oil prices. It, printing money can buy you goods, but only it doesn't create real goods. You need like a real economy to create goods. So you have more money pr- chasing after the same number or even less number of real goods here. So that would be my question for you, Swithin. Like, why don't they print more? That's a very good question. Um, first and foremostly, in any situation, um, you don't want to get to a situation where the inflation rate is so high that people cease to use the money because that that sort of kills the golden goose because if no one uses the money you can't then use it to um to expropriate people indirectly because no one will use the money so you you need to avoid avoid hyperinflation because basically the game is up so um Zimbabwe, for instance, ever since its currency basically collapsed, has been significantly more constrained in what it can do than it would be if it was able to control its own money, the own, its own money supply. So, you don't want to get that far. Um, another thing you won't want to do is probably have a radical alteration in your exchange rate because it looks looks bad. And makes your country look like you've got um, your your currency is worth is sort of reduced in value relative to others. 
Um, now, the way they get around this is by a lot of coordin- international coordination of monetary policy. Um, they're seen via, say, like the Bank of International Settlements, which I don't actually know a huge amount about. Um, but the, the, it's at least via that or other forums, the world central banks actually talk to each other. And um, there does seem to be a reasonable amount of coordination. Um, and so that prevents the exchange rates going from too much, uh, uh, being too volatile, which can sort of harm confidence in the markets. Um, but the first and foremost, I think any political government would want to avoid the hyperinflation situation. We then get to the question, as you mentioned, about um, the independence or otherwise of the central bank. And I think here, really, we get into questions of elite theory and who really are the, who we, who really are those people who are pulling the strings. Is it the politicians or is it the financial class or is it somebody else? This is an interesting topic because it it comes in very nicely when we discuss uh, the ousting of Liz Truss, who is now by far the shortest serving UK prime minister of all time at 44 days. Prior to that, George Canning survived 191 days, but he only resigned because he had a stroke and then died a year later. Um, The main reason Truss was removed, it would seem, is she upset the pension funds because she was going to engage in even more deficit spending. But her argument for this was going to cause growth because uh, by cutting taxes, you would you would incentivize more work. Um, that the pension funds then it started um, selling their um, the government bonds and gilts and things, which then caused the uh, because their their creditors were sort of um, a, bit, a bit sort of um, upset and nervous that the government might be less likely to be able to repay their debts. So they ended up selling the gilts and then that pushed the gilt price down. And then the Bank of England stepped in to buy up. Um, some gilts to keep the price up. Otherwise, the value of the assets of these pension funds would have gone down significantly. So it does seem to be the case that uh, um, that the big financial groupings uh, have a vested interest in making sure that there isn't too much inflation and not uh, make sure interest rates don't rise too much and therefore um, bond prices don't go down by too much because otherwise it would harm their assets and uh, potentially cause collapse of these large financial organizations. Um, So the question, I think, and I I think that's true, and I think this is true of the banking class in general. Yes, they want inflation because they benefit from it, because basically via fractional reserve banking, they can produce their own money. Well, they can produce credit, which functions as money, and so it benefits them. But they can't have too much of it um, because the interest rates will go up too much then the central bank will increase interest rates because, remember, they want to prevent hyperinflation. Um, And so one of the main things is to keep the expropriate, keep the golden goose, but to make sure the golden goose maximizes the amount of uh, sort of indirect tax that they can get. This is the government and also the, the, the financial sector. Uh, they've got to do it on a level such that it's not quite as noticeable. Uh, when you get sort of high, high inflation, that of, of price inflation of goods, then that becomes more obvious and you've got to kind of get around it. When you have asset prices going up, is what actually happened in 2008 onwards, a lot of the newly created money actually went into um, asset prices. Um, and then that can be sold as a good thing because people are, oh, you're better off rather than, oh, no, your, your steak now or your bread now costs a lot more. Um, so... They, I would say what they would want to do is to print as much money as they can, but keep inflation at a level that is not going to be politically problematic. And of course, uh, isn't radically different inflation wise than any other country. And if they do that, they can keep taking more and more. Uh, Now, clearly, if it was the case that somehow a more demagogic uh, political figure was somehow to be able to get the reins of the uh, central bank, then maybe they may try and go spend, 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 print, 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 um, buy even more, which they might do. Um, but um, that doesn't seem to happen yet. It is true, though, in like 2020, they printed a hell of a lot of money, absolutely loads, even more by 2008 standards. 
and especially the monetary aggregate M2, which in, is a slightly broader measure, including sort of savings accounts, stuff, that goes up massively as well, uh, more so than it did in uh, 2008. But the reason they did this was basically to prop up the financial sector. And at that present, at that time, that wasn't going to be hugely inflationary because people weren't spending because there wasn't anything to spend on because everything was closed. But then what you have now is you have all that money there and people can go out and spend it. Oh, unsurprisingly, prices then get bid up. Um, but that was but a lot of that monetary inflation that took place in 2020 was to save the stock market. Because if you look at the stock market and things, uh, when lockdowns were going to appear, the stock prices absolutely tank. And actually, I believe the FTSE 100 still has not got back to the same value it was in like February 2020. And that's with the inflation that's happened subsequently. So actually, well, the real value of the FTSE 100, which is the uh, is the sh- share price of the top 100 firms in the UK added up to create the index of FTSE 100, is now worth less than it was in February 2020. Um, so those, I think, would be the reasons why. Although with respect to Peter Schiff and stuff and predicting uh, recessions, um, that's a slightly different topic. Although, again, there could be hyperinflation because I mean, it's a very difficult act because you could get it wrong. I mean, if it's the case that there's another alternative that's better than the, the current central bank's money, the dollar of a pound, for instance, um, then people might switch over to use another currency. And as Alistair McLeod has said, one of the major causes of actual hyperinflation isn't actually printing more money. It's actually getting to a situation where people go, we well, you know what, this isn't very good anymore. We'll use something else. At which point the demand for the currency then goes down, coupled with the previous significant uh, money printing, then causing the purchasing power of it to d- dramatically collapse and therefore prices denominated in that currency to rocket. Is in that sense, is it like a bank run where, like, if one bank is bad, everyone goes to the bank and withdraws their money? But in effect, um, once pe- hyperinflation happens, when every everyone realizes, oh, this currency is just lo- like toilet paper, I need to get rid of it as quickly as I can and convert it into goods. Is that, in effect, what hyperinflation looks like, or is that a way to look at it? Yes, uh, flight to real values. I think uh, Mises uh, mentions that happened towards the end, like a hyperinflationary position. Uh, that uh, people will just uh, you know, get out of cash and get into anything because anything will keep its value better than cash. So um, just try and buy sort of assets, physical assets that might be um, used. I mean, one obvious thing you could do in that case today would be to go out to the petrol, uh, petrol stations and just take as much petrol or diesel as you can and try and store it at home. Because if you stored, if you stored your... Uh, the, what you, if you stored your wealth in that rather than money relative to the currency, the value of the um, the oil would go up massively. So, yes. One of the things which always interests me is, uh, and part of the problem with this is, I think it does take a lot to understand it to some extent. But what you know, what you talk about with Mises here, um, the, the, there's a certain kind of Ricardo Smithian Misesian economics, which just makes logical sense. You have a double coincidence of once problems, money just comes in, solve that problem, and so forth. And then you have, you know, you, you imagine banking in a very simple, like like platonic examples. You have a hundred dollars in cash, you want to loan it out, okay? And you say, well, if I'll give you a hundred and five if in a year, because I think I can do Project X, which has a twenty dollar return, but I'll give you. 25% of the property, which is $5 a yeah. So you can imagine these simple examples. So you can go from these ex- these ex- simple examples to these collateralized debt obligations. And these 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 are very complex financial systems. And th- then, then on top of that, like some of the Marxist critics of economics start making sense here. And you say flight to real value. Well, they have this sort of complicated financial system. And then you have this, 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 which seems extremely to use a Talebian, the same Talebian phrase, it seems to be fragile. It seems to be kind of trying to thread the needle between, well, we don't want to print too much because then everyone will go to flight to real value. But if we print too little, we don't get enough. Uh, it's in a sense, it's like a it's like a like a hostage negotiation here, where as they might just you know give up on the game here. So I I find I find this system to be very somewhat fragile and complicated, uh, which makes me believe I don't understand it. But at some point I said, no, this it's just fragile on purpose or, you know, it is purposely fragile. Would you say the system is rather fragile? Yeah, like how robust would you say 
this sort of international system of, you know, what you certain you described opening, um, you said there's some, you know, back channels between these banks and they, that sounds like a conspiracy here. Uh, <laughs> LOL. Um, you know, that, that sounds like conspiracy here. Like, you know, how much, uh, is it a quote unquote conspiracy? So to speak, you know, like, like how much control does this system take? Cause you can imagine a simpler version of economics, which makes hundred percent sense. Like, you know, okay, I want 20 apples. You have 20 fish and I have a, a, a I don't know, a piano. How do you make an chain and change? You can imagine these Ricardo and type and the, the, uh, I forget, uh, I forget, uh, Bastiat type examples where money makes a lot of sense, but then you have this sort of funny money that comes in, um, which, you know, produces problems. Would you say it's fairly fragile or how, how robust would you say it is? And what's, so then, oh, the system clearly isn't robust. Um, a banking system of a hundred percent reserves, or a situation where even if you're going to lend to somebody for an indefinite time period, you know you're uh, lending on an indefinite time period. So you know you don't get the money back. That that would be a relatively um, um, stable system. But insofar as you have fractional reserves, you're always going to be playing. You're going to be rolling the dice, and. Um, that's true. I mean, even the sort of fractional reserve free bankers say that. Um, at least it would be relatively more fragile than 100%, but they say, well, the, the benefits will outweigh the costs. But the only way that you can really run very low fraction reserves is because eventually you get bailed out by the central bank. And I, I believe that's basically Rothbard's claim is the predominant origin of Federal Reserve is that you had all these individual banks, they ran fractional reserves. Eventually there was a bank run because, well, it's going to happen at some point if you're running fractional reserves and people can come and, and want to pull out their money and you don't have enough money to pay everybody because, well, you've um, lent out more money than you actually have. Um, so the way that you try to make the system more stable is by getting the central bank in who can then buy up um, assets to uh, influence interest rates, make sure there's more money pumped around when it's needed. So, for instance, if um, the... I, I, no, it's not the discount rate. Of which one is it? It's the um, the fair. Oh, I'm thinking it's the discount. It's the yes, yeah, the discount rate. I think uh, if if the overnight rate that banks lend to each other at the interest rate goes above the federal 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 Reserve's target, what they'll do is they'll just buy bonds, buy government bonds from the banks to pump more money in to reduce the interest rates, um, to make it easier for them to finance their uh, overnight lending. Um, and that's what they do. And in the absence of this, is the system wouldn't. The, the central bank there is sort of to plug plug the gaps. Oh, just to know, the idea behind um, well, the the easiest way to think about it is if they buy an, an asset from the bank, they've got more money to lend out, and if there's more money in the system sort of to, to be lent, there's a great supply of loans, so the interest rate falls. That's the easiest way of thinking about it. Um, so the central bank, as it were, makes it more robust but then again makes it less robust because it encourages people to be utterly crazy uh with uh uh lending practices um so 2008 is a good example of that um but ultimately running a system um whereby um you have i say fractional reserves um all these weird debt, debt obligations um, you know, it, it, to a large extent, is a house of cards. I mean, you can keep plugging the gaps, but eventually it will uh, it will go down. Also, as well, I would say, although this is less of a business cycle point, to the extent that this continues, effectively, what's going to happen is you're going to get a consistent increase in the inequality of wealth amongst people from, because the more first receivers you get, uh, and if they're the same type of person over time, so government contractors, defense departments, banks, et cetera, they'll become uh, richer at the expense of everybody else. Um, and once sort of uh, sort of income division becomes too large, then you're going to get um, sort of social problems. In addition, it will harm long-run growth as well, whatever growth is. We did an episode on that a while back, because essentially what you're doing is you're giving resources to people who aren't necessarily productive Um which, of course, is not a good idea if the goal is to sort of increase the aggregate wealth of the society. So it's fragile and also has those two long term problems built into it as well. The does it does this is an a priori argument. There might be an empirical. Does it change? Does the existence of the central bank like if you have a parachute 
Um, and and actually, Nassim Taleb would would make the claim that um, th- that airplanes with uh, people with parach when people carry parachutes or things like that, they do it does change the way they they well seatbelts do supposedly change the way people drive. Um, but if you have central banks, they're always there to rescue you if you fall down. Does this? Does I would say yes on an a priori level based on just you thinking about incentives. It would have to. Does it change the way people lend? Because even in two thousand eight, the one of the reasons why there were subprime was there was a political motive. You had you wanted banks to lend out money to a group of people that were more or less subprime. They weren't people that were likely to pay back their uh, uh, loans here for better or worse. Now maybe you should say, well people should give charity to them or people should give mutual aid to them, um, but you shouldn't give them loans. But you know that's just sort of the w- way in which. Um, you know, it works here, but you have people that have like, you know, we can argue about credit scores and what that and so forth, but you have groups of people that here in the United States who, you know, and, and again, the contractors liked it. They got to build new houses. They got to build things. Utility people liked it. They got to build new pipes, the internet people. Lots of people liked all these subprime mortgages because there are all these downstream effects. And for the first people, they're very positive. This is the political aspects to printing banks, which is why I asked the question like, if this is so good, why don't they do them more? What's stopping them? Um, you know, and some of the free college for all people will try to make similar arguments. Well, we can build out new universities. We can build out new dorms and things like that. It seems like there's just a, the eyes can go wide here. So that's my two questions. Does it change the behavior of people? Um, and then second of all, again, to ask the question, or, you know, is my example roughly correct and why not more? Swithin? With respect to the central bank, a uh, lender of last resort is important, but I think more important is their day-to-day runnings to keep interest rates from rising, to maintain, uh, make it easier for uh, banks to maintain their uh, lending to each other and uh, overall costs um, of, of lending and stuff. That's going to make that um, is um, is is the main function because generally speaking. Banks do not want to borrow from uh, the central bank because nobody else will deal with them because it means that they're a terrible, terrible credit risk. Um, still, uh, so it, it, I wouldn't necessarily say the lender of last resort as such, but it's it's the way in which they can put money in the system to keep the money going, which is uh, the important bit. With respect to free college for all, etc., um, yes, there is a big uh, client base to try and get that to happen. Um and I think it could happen. Um, the, the whether the money men, whether it would be increase uh, deficits enough such that trying to um, sell bonds to the markets and stuff would become more difficult and harm harm the bond market significantly. Uh, the bond market is absolutely massive and is one of the major things that is used in collateralized trade. Um, so actually. Um, some have argued actually that uh, actually by running deficits, the uh, central bank is actually a creditor in like loads of cr- transactions because it, it, it's it's the bond which backs a lot of these um, uh, sort of collateralized debt uh, debt uh, instruments. Now, obviously, housing was as well, but government bonds are very 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 um, uh, liquid. People generally want to buy them because well. The Bank of England, sorry, the the, the um, UK government and the Fed and the uh, federal government in the US, they pay their debts back um, because I mean the UK has defaulted like twice or three times in three hundred years. This isn't the same, for instance, of Argentina who um, never pay you back, or well, if if you're a foreign bondholder, that is. Um, so uh, I think that uh, where whether they whether they print more to do it and run more deficits basically dependent on how much they think the markets can tolerate a um, an increase in the deficit uh, and also how inflationary will it be because if inflation becomes too bad a social disorder if food prices go too high this, this is revolutionary time um, so you've got to avoid that but apart from that um, it's um, you can you can do as much as you want. It's just going to depend on the circumstances, I would say. Of course, though, you could always get it wrong. You could always put too much in and make an error, and, and that I think is um, is is the problem. I mean, I think the central banks have thought that we had to sort of save the markets in twenty twenty, um, 
and of course, there is of course the old argument that a lot of the lockdown stuff was coordinated as a big deliberate wealth transfer operation because they knew that the markets were uh, doing badly. You had an inversion. I think it was an inversion of the yield curve in like um, twenty nineteen August. I think it was then. Didn't you occur in that? You had a very yeah. You, you had a very a significant increase in the overnight interest rate very quickly, which the Federal Reserve was very keen to put a lid on very quickly. Inversive yield curve means that uh, long-term bonds have a lower interest rate than uh, short-term bonds, uh, which is highly unusual because you normally expect if you're lending for a longer time period to, to, to command that greater return because you won't have access to the money for as long. And that tends to be indic- um, predictive as a recession. Um, but as I say, the central bank could get things wrong. I mean, the Weimar German, I, I doubt the Weimar German central bankers wanted hyperinflation, and neither did the, the Zimbabweans, but it just kind of happened. Um, and and when you're dealing, when you're increasing the money supply at such astonishing rates, it's as is it's as of course a possibility. What would be the ideal? Now again, you could always ask, you know, what's the ideal? There's a, a big philosophical question there to begin with. And uh, but what would be the ideal rate of inflation? Musk, Elon Musk, and again, I, there's criticisms you can make of him all you want, and I probably agree he might be propped up by the government and defense. I get it. Um, but. Um, uh, Musk has said that you know you don't want a zero inflation rate. Now again, that's that's a value statement, but um, um he said that on a Babylon B interview. Uh, and, uh, some of the Bitcoin people have also said that same thing. You do want some inflation. Now I don't know that that's a sort of that sort of begs the question again of what is what is the ideal scenario here? Like you know if you have an inflation rate, do you want to spend now, or do you want to spend if if, if money's going to be worth more in the future, if if you have more purchasing power in the future than now. What you want to do is save. If you have less purchasing power in the future, the rational person would spend now. Um, so a lot of the people who want who want inflation will say, "Well, it'll, it'll make saving now." Because I think some of the Keynesians seem to think that short-term spending is actually a benefit. Uh, uh, so, so what would be the ideal um, inflation rate? I mean, does the do the Austrians or the end of the individual Austrians, Salerno, Mises, Rothbard? have a position on the matter like do they think it should just be decided by the market but the market at least in the quote-unquote crony capitalist world we live in now um it does have it's a, in a sense it's a political question decided by the political authorities but in a sense it's also decided by the culture too you know do you, uh or 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 does that create the culture i mean you could argue there's a there's a sort of a, a libertinizing or a de- degeneracy creating thing about making things worth now you don't have it changes your time preference. So, what would be the ideal inflation rate? What would if what would be the Swithistan, uh, uh, or Rothbardistan, or Mesiastan inflation rate? Zero, negative, two percent. Um, that's the Friedmanites, I think. And um, what would you be, Swithin? When it comes to the ideal inflation rate, um, it the the two percent rate taken up by central banks around the world, I think, is taken up for two reasons. One is one is to sort of encourage people to spend. The idea is, oh, we need to spend. And you've got these dollars um, and things to uh, to spend, and this is going to increase output. Um, the argument for this is predominantly um, based on the Keynesian idea that you get this big sort of separation of consumption and production. In contrast, say, to what was uh, Say's law, which argued that supply constituted a demand, um, Keynes bastardized it to... Uh, supply creates its own demand, which is untrue. And so Keynes said, oh, we've got all these gluts in, in production and people aren't buying it because spare capacity, so we need to get spending up. And so a lot of central bankers and things are taking into that Keynesian position. And that's also true of the monetarists as well, to some extent, and the MMTers. There's also the argument that uh, you want 2% because you want to be able to prevent what's called real wage unemployment. The idea is f- workers are going to object to having their wages cut in nominal terms. That is, if you pay them £10 an hour, and you reduce the wage to nine pounds now because you reduce your cost. Workers go, well, hang on, being made worse off, and um, uh, might have um, unions might get involved and they might um, op- oppose this taking place and make it more difficult. And so, to, and if firms really do need to reduce their costs in real terms, then instead of reducing their wages, they might just go, well, we'll have to fire them instead, and then go, oh no, there's going to be real wage unemployment in this case because wages are flexible downwards in nominal terms. And so, therefore, we need to have 2% unemployment because it gives you know, employees a bit of wiggle room to reduce nominal wages um, without, sorry, re- reduce real wages, sorry, about reducing nominal wages because basically people won't, 
he gets concerned about it. They'll go, well, I was only paid £10 now. Yeah, we've got inflation at 2%, but no, I've still got £10, so that's okay. Even though essentially if you keep your, your wage at £10 an hour and there's a 2% inflation, your real wage has gone down in that case. Um, so those are the predominant reasons as to why the inflation rate is, is um, chosen to be a 2%. In Rothbardistan, or so we understand, I mean, you should think about what the purpose of money is. Double coincidence of wants, medium of exchange, but it's also an asset. Um, so I think in general, you at least don't want the asset to go down in value. And if ideally you want it to go up in value. Um, now, obviously, you don't want to go up in value too much, because if it goes up in value too much, that's going to mean that prices denominated in that currency are going to be highly uh, fluctuate a lot. And you're going to want some predictability. So I would argue that the ideal situation would be some sort of moderate deflationary uh, position. I don't know what a figure would be, let's say 2 3%. Um, and uh, this is what you'd expect. Uh, if you've got productivity improvements, prices go down and people like prices going down. Now, will this encourage people to save? Well, yes, but saving is good, contra Keynes, because genuine saving is then producing more resources for investment. Now, if it's the case that people save too much, as it were. Well, that means there's lots of investment could take place. Um, but if it's the case that entrepreneurs don't think there's uh, much value in investing because, well, uh, people won't buy could buy their stuff because there's, they're going to save, okay, investment goes down. And so uh, increases in output go down. Well, the, the, the rate of increase falls, which then means there'll be less deflation, which then means people would save less and spend more. And so there's no reason why you couldn't get like an uh, a happy medium over time with that. There's no necessary reason why that's the case. So, um, yeah, um, you want prices to go down. Now, deflation has a bad name because a lot of the time you have actual monetary deflation in uh, busts because you get bank runs and the, the pyramiding of the lending from the fractional reserve banking ceases and the money supply goes down. Um, and it's not that it's not necessarily that um, prices going down is bad per se. It's just that in most cases since well, in more modern times, the deflation has occurred is because of um, a recession. Uh, and that's because of the malinvestments during the boom. That's nothing to do with deflation per se. As Rothbard would like to point out, you had deflation of moderate sorts in, in the late 19th century in the US. Um, and I think as well in the 20s as well, there was some deflation, even in the roaring times, although I think it was probably around zero, actually. Uh, and also I'd say is no individual cares about the inflation rate. What they care about is stuff that they buy. And if their stuff is going up in price, um, they'll um, they'll buy less of it or they'll try and buy quicker before it goes up. So it's going to depend on the types of good. Um, the argument is going to be durable goods. But the, the, the argument, the problem is with the durable good argument. So a durable good one is you don't consume and disappear. So a burger you would eat and it disappear. Buy a washing machine. They'll go, oh, yeah, well, you know, if there's deflation and the washing machines keep coming cheaper, you'll never buy the washing machine. It's like... Well, you will, because you'll just buy it when you need it, because you just go out and go, oh, I want a new washing machine, I'll buy it. Um, now, you might put off buying it, but I mean, well, so what? I mean, I, I don't really, this means there's more resources to be used elsewhere. Um, also, if there's um, price, back, back to actually inflation, and this is what they do, the general statisticians with the inflation rate is, well, if um, if the quality goes up, you say that's a price decrease. But, well, in that case, then, Increases in quality are bad to some extent because they act like deflation. So I could buy a TV this year for 400 pounds. I buy one next year for 400 pounds. Next year won't probably be better than this year's because the quality's gone up. That gives me reason not to buy TVs. But then the question is, is the TV market in a bad way? Well, well, no, probably not. So even if it is a, does dissuade me from buying, it does give me reason not to. It doesn't seem to be much of an issue. So uh, I'm very much a fan of moderate deflation. And actually, to first, so is George Selgin. Now, he doesn't like um, monetary deflation. He wants to avoid that. And I don't care about that particularly. If he's going to wipe out the bad, then fine. Uh, but George Selgin is, is in favor of deflation if it's caused by um, an increase in productivity and output rather than a decrease in the money supply or the demand for money. Uh, sorry, sorry, an increase in demand for money, more precisely in that case, not a decrease. Um, so those would be my um, overall thoughts. I just now like to thank everyone for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with uh, your friends and family and subscribe to us on Podbean on YouTube. The more subscribers we get, the higher we get in the search rankings and the more people can access this material. And if you'd like to contact the show for any reason at all, please contact us at mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. That's mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. 